part of the occupational English test has three parts, and in each part you hear a number of different extracts. At the beginning of the test, you will hear a beep sound. You have time to read the questions before you hear the extracts. You will hear each extract only once. You have to complete your answers as you listen. At the end of each test, you will be given two minutes to check answers. Part A. In this part of the test, you hear two different extracts. In each extract, a health professional is talking to his patient. For questions 1 to 24, complete the notes with the information you hear. Now look at the notes for extract 1. Extract 1, questions 1 to 12. You hear a doctor talking to a patient called Hiramichi. For questions 1 to 12, complete the following notes with a word or short phrase. You now have 30 seconds to look at the notes. Hello, doctor. Good morning. Good morning. What's your problem? Well, doctor, I feel like suffocating whenever I lie flat on my back. I have noticed that whenever I would recline backwards, I get this feeling and the problem has worsened recently. I'm now sleeping in an upright position. What's your age? 54, doctor. You had any surgeries earlier? No, doctor. Do you get chest pain? No, doctor. I get frequent urination and shortness of breath. Do you have any sort of bleeding disorder? No, doctor. Have you suffered or are you suffering with any other diseases? Yes, I have type 2 diabetes mellitus, hypertension, asthma, and high cholesterol. May I know if there is any family history of diseases? Well, my brothers had prostate cancer and my father had brain cancer. My brothers and sister have diabetes. Okay, what medications are you taking? I am taking glipizide, uh, 5 milligrams twice a day, metformin, 500 milligrams twice a day, Atticand, 16 milligrams daily, metoprolol, 25 milligrams twice daily, Lipitor, 10 milligrams daily, pantoprazole, 40 milligrams daily, Flomax, uh, 0.4 milligrams daily, Detrol, 4 milligrams daily, Zyrtec 10 milligrams daily, Advair Discus 100 over 50 micrograms, uh, one puff twice a day, and uh, Fluticasone spray 50 micrograms, two sprays daily. Are you allergic to any medication? No, doctor. Extract 2. Questions 13 to 24. You hear a physician talking to a patient called Mackenzie. For questions 13 to 24, complete the following notes with a word or short phrase. You now have 30 seconds to look at the notes. Good morning, doctor. Good morning. Uh, have your seat. What's your problem? Well, I have a two-year history of small cell lung cancer that has metastasized in both femurs, lower lumbar spine, and pelvis. 
I had numerous chemotherapy and radiation treatments and just completed a series of 10 radiation treatments for pain relief. But I have persistent pain symptoms, mostly in my low back and on the right side radiating down the back of my right leg to knee. I have some numbness in the bottom of my left foot and some throbbing pain in the left foot at times. The pain worsens with prolonged sitting in a car, walking, or standing. Well, what is your age? I'm 45, doctor. You had any surgery? Yes, a chest port placement. What medications are you taking now? Duragesic patch, 250 micrograms total. Celebrex, 200 milligrams once daily. Iron, 240 milligrams twice daily. Paxil, 20 milligrams daily. Neurotonin, 300 milligrams three times daily. And Percocet. I am also having Warfarin, one milligram daily to keep my chest port patent. Do you drink or smoke? Yes, I smoke one pack a day, and it has been the same habit for about 30 years, and I drink beer approximately twice a day. Don't know when I started that. Well, the neurological examinations show that reflexes are 2 plus in both knees and absent at both ankles. Sensations are decreased uh, distally in the left foot, otherwise intact to pinprick. Examination of your lumbar spine shows normal lumbar lordosis with fairly functional range of movement. There's a significant tenderness at your lower back lumbar facet and sacroiliac joints uh, that seem to reproduce a lot of your low back and right leg complaints. The multiple scan reports reveal that abnormal uptake involving the femurs bilaterally. You have increased uptake in the sacroiliac joint regions bilaterally. MRI of the lower hip joints shows heterogeneous bone marrow signal in both proximal femurs. Pelvis CT shows a trabecular pattern with healed metastases. CT of the orbits reveal a small amount of fluid in the mastoid air cells on the right. You have small cell lung cancer with metastasis at the lower lumbar spine, pelvis, and both femurs. Symptomatic facet and sacroiliac joint syndrome on the right and chronic pain syndrome. Peripheral neuropathy of your left foot is probably secondary to the chemo and radiation treatments. I will plan on injecting your right sacroiliac and facet joints under fluoroscopy today. If the pain is persistent even after this injection, you can take an extra 50 microgram patch and take a couple of extra Percocet if needed. From now you stop taking Paxil and I am planning to start Cymbalta instead. That is the end of part A. Now look at part B. Part B. In this part of the test, you will hear six different extracts. In each extract, you'll hear people talking in a different healthcare environment. For questions 25 to 30, choose the answer A, B, or C, which fits best according to what you hear. You will have time to read each question before you listen to the audio. Complete the answers as you listen to the audio. Now look at question 25. You hear a discussion between a nurse and a physician explaining about Nipah virus. Now read the question. Hello, doctor. Can you explain what the Nipah virus is? Well, Nipah virus is a member of the paramic severity genus Henipavirus. This Nipah virus was initially identified and isolated in 1999 during an outbreak of encephalitis 
and respiratory problems among pig farmers and other people with close contact with pigs in Singapore and Malaysia. The name of the virus originated from Sungai Nipha, a village in Malaysia where pig farmers became sick with encephalitis. Initially, the disease was linked with Hendra virus, emerged from bats, but was quickly singled out for investigation, and flying foxes of the genus were subsequently identified as the reservoir for the Nipah virus. Question 26. You hear a monologue of a physician explaining about the use of thimerosal in vaccines. Now read the question. Thimerosal is a mercury-based preservative that has been used for many decades in the U.S. in multi-dose vials of medicines and vaccines. There is no significant evidence of side effects caused by the mild doses of thimerosal in vaccines, except for minor reactions such as redness and swelling at the injected site. However, during 1999, the public health service agencies, the American Academy of Pediatrics and vaccine manufacturers agreed to reduce or eliminate thimerosal usage in vaccines as a precautionary measure. Methylmercury is obtained from certain kinds of fish. A high exposure to methylmercury can be toxic to people. However, over a lifetime, everybody is exposed to some methylmercury. Thimerosal contains ethyl mercury, which is the most widely used form of organic mercury that is cleared from our body more quickly than methyl mercury and is likely to cause any harm to the individuals. Question 27. You hear a discussion between two doctors on adjuvants used in vaccines. Now read the question. Doctor, what is an adjuvant, and why are adjuvants added to vaccines? Well, an adjuvant is used in vaccines to create a stronger immune response in patients. Certain vaccines made from dead or weakened germs contain naturally obtained adjuvants and help the human body produce a strong protective immune response. These vaccines often must be made with adjuvants to ensure the body produces an immune response strong enough to protect the patient from the germ he or she is being vaccinated against. In the U.S., monophosphoryl lipid A and aluminum are used as adjuvants in the vaccines. Monophosphoryl lipid A has been used as an ingredient since 2009 in the vaccine called Cerverix. Aluminum salts or gels are used as ingredients in vaccines since 1930. However, most vaccines developed today include just small components of germs, such as their proteins, rather than the entire virus or bacteria. Question 28. You hear a monologue of a physician explaining about typhus fevers. Now read the question. Typhus fevers are a group of diseases caused by bacteria spread to humans by chiggers, lice, and fleas. Typhus fevers include murine typhus, scrub typhus, and epidemic typhus. While the chiggers spread scrub typhus, body lice spread epidemic typhus, and fleas spread murine typhus. Typhus fevers include murine typhus, scrub typhus, and epidemic typhus. While the chiggers spread the scrub typhus, body lice spread epidemic typhus, and fleas spread murine typhus. Fever, headaches, and sometimes rash are the most common symptoms of the typhus fevers. Epidemic typhus, also known as Lausborn typhus, is an uncommon disease caused by a bacteria called Rickettsia proezeki spread through contact with infected body lice. Though epidemic typhus was responsible for millions of deaths during earlier centuries, today it is considered a rare disease. Epidemic typhus is called sylvatic typhus in the U.S. 
It occurs very rarely. Scrub typhus or bush typhus is a disease caused by a bacteria called Orienta tsutsugamashi. Question 29. You hear a discussion between two doctors about VX and its effects. Now read the question. Hello, doctor. What is VX and how is it obtained? VX is a man-made chemical warfare agent classified as a nerve agent, which are the most toxic and rapidly acting of the known chemical warfare agents, which are similar to pesticides called organophosphates. Symptoms will start appearing within a few seconds of exposure to the vapor form of VX, while the appearance of symptoms may take from a few minutes to 18 hours of exposure to liquid form of VX. Compared with a nerve agent called sarin, VX is much more toxic by entry through the skin and much more toxic by inhalation. Since VX is the least volatile nerve agent with the slowest evaporation level from liquid to vapor, it can be a long-term threat as well as a short-term threat. Question 30. You hear a monologue of a doctor briefing about rubella disease. Now read the question. Rubella is a contagious disease caused by a virus, which is also known as German measles. However, the disease is caused by a different virus than measles. With MMR vaccine, rubella disease can be prevented. This vaccine protects against three diseases, mumps, rubella, and measles. Rubella was a common disease in the U.S. before the invention of vaccines. The last major epidemic occurred between 1964 to 1965, when there was an estimated 12.5 million rubella cases in the country. However, rubella was completely eradicated due to successful vaccination programs in the country since 2004. That is the end of Part B. Now look at Part C. Part C. In this part of the test, you'll hear two different extracts. In each extract, you'll hear health professionals talking about specific aspects of their work. For questions 31 to 42, choose the answer A, B, or C, which best fits according to what you hear. Complete the answers as you listen to the audio. Now, look at Extract 1. Extract 1. Questions 31 to 36. You hear the discussion between a senior doctor and junior doctors about bone marrow transplant procedures. You have 90 seconds to read questions 31 to 36.
Hello, doctor. Can you kindly explain bone marrow transplant procedures? Well, bone marrow consists of precursor or predecessor immature cells called stem cells. These are primitive cells that are capable of producing all types of cells. Blood cells like red blood cells, white blood cells, and platelets start out from young cells called hematopoietic stem cells. Stem cells mostly live in the bone marrow where they divide and make new blood cells. These cells mature into adult cells and then leave the marrow into the bloodstream. A small amount of stem cells also get into the bloodstream, which are called peripheral blood stem cells. When the bone marrow has been destroyed by disease, chemotherapy, or radiation, the stem cells may be transplanted and restored. Depending on the source of the stem cells, this procedure may be called either bone marrow transplant or peripheral blood stem cell transplant or cord blood transplant. These three types are called hematopoietic stem cell transplant. There are three possible sources of stem cells to use for transplants, which includes bone marrow, the bloodstream, or peripheral blood, umbilical cord blood from newborns. The first successful bone marrow transplant was done in 1968. After nearly two decades, stem cells taken from peripheral blood were transplanted with success. More recently, doctors have started using cord blood from the placenta and umbilical cords of newborn babies as another source of stem cells. Today, nearly 50,000 new transplants are done each year. Well, doctor, when is a bone marrow transplant required? Stem cell transplants are used to replace bone marrow that's been destroyed by diseases such as leukemia, aplastic anemia, certain inherited blood, exposure to cancer chemotherapy, cancer radiation therapy, some diseases of the immune system. In these conditions, the stem cells become incapable to make adequate blood cells. Therefore, a stem cell transplant may help correct these problems. In certain types of cancers, such as certain leukemias, multiple myeloma, and some lymphomas, a stem cell transplant can be an essential part of treatment. For these patients, high doses of chemotherapy or radiation therapy, although a good option, the procedure causes bone marrow suppression. Therefore, once high doses are used, a stem cell transplant is made to replenish the suppressed marrow. Different types of bone marrow transplant include autologous transplant, cells come from the patient's own bone marrow, allogeneic transplant, the cells come from a matched related or unrelated donor, syngeneic transplant, the cells are derived from an identical twin. Autologous stem cell transplant, in this type, the patient's own bone marrow cells are taken prior to the anti-cancer procedure, and these stem cells are harvested from either bone marrow or blood and then frozen. The advantage is that the patients get their own blood cells, and thus there is a decreased risk of the immune system not recognizing the cells and rejecting them, or mounting an attack on them, which is called graft rejection, and rejection makes allogeneic transplants difficult. The disadvantage of this process is the risk of the originally taken stem cells carrying cancer cells that are reintroduced in the body. This may bring the cancer back. Normally, autologous stem cell transplant is mainly used to treat certain leukemias with lymphomas and multiple myeloma. At times, it is also used for other types of cancers, especially in children. In a tandem transplant, a patient gets two courses of high-dose chemo, each followed by a transplant of their own stem cells. All of the stem cells needed are collected before the first high-dose chemo treatment, and half of them are used for each procedure. Allogeneic stem cell transplant. In this type, the stem cells do not come from the patient but from a donor whose tissue type is matched with the patient. Usually, the donor is a family member or sibling of the patient. The donor may be sought from a national registry as well. This may be called a matched, unrelated donor transplant. Cord blood transplant is another procedure where blood is taken from the placenta and umbilical cord of newborns. This blood has a high number of stem cells, but the number of stem cells in a unit of cord blood is often too low for large adults. So this source of stem cells has so far been used more in children. The advantage of allogenic transplant is that the donor stem cells make their own immune cells, which may help destroy any cancer cells in the patient. The disadvantage is the risk of graft rejection that may require lifelong use of immunity-suppressing agents. Allogenic transplant is most often used to treat certain types of leukemia, lymphomas, and other bone marrow disorders such as myelodysplasia, a number of factors play a role in how the immune system knows the difference between self and non-self. The most important factor that is used in allogenic transplants is called human leukocyte antigen system. Human leukocyte antigens are proteins found on the surface of most cells. Each person has a number of pairs of human leukocyte antigens. 
They inherit one of each of these antigens from each of their parents. Physicians try to match these antigens when finding a donor for patient person getting a stem cell transplant. Syngeneic stem cell transplant is possible only between identical twins or triplets with similar genetic makeup. An advantage of syngeneic stem cell transplant is that graft versus host disease will not be a problem. There are no cancer cells in the transplant. Now, look at extract 2, questions 37 to 42. You hear the discussion of a physician with junior doctors on bone cancer. You have 90 seconds to read questions 37 to 42.
Hello, doctor. Can you explain what is bone cancer? Well, bone cancer or sarcoma may be of two types. Primary bone cancer that begins in the bone and secondary bone cancer that originates elsewhere in the body, such as lungs, breast, liver, and metastasizes to the bone. The bone cancer usually begins with bone pain that usually gets worse over time and may wake the affected person from sleep. There may be bone fractures with less severe impact or trauma, swelling and tenderness over the affected area as well. Joint movement may become difficult if the joints are affected. Moreover, there may be weakness, weight loss, fever, and other general symptoms. The risk factors for bone cancer include exposure to radiation in the past, having Paget's disease of the bone that affects the growth cycle of the bone cells. Only around 1% of patients with Paget's disease may develop bone cancer. There is no evidence that an injury to the bone causes any cancer. However, there may be a link to rare genetic conditions such as Lee-Fermini syndrome. Bone is composed of cells that grow and form collagen fibers, as well as minerals like calcium that give it sturdiness. Osteoblasts and osteoclasts are the two main types of cells within the hard bone tissue that mold the bone. Osteoblasts form the bone by laying down bone material, while osteoclasts dissolve the particles of bone and cause resorption. These cells are active throughout life and work in tandem to balance to keep the bone constantly growing and dissolving. There is a slow but constant turnover of bone. Another type of cell is chondrocytes that make cartilage. These make the hard tissues that cover the ends of bones and joints. In the middle of some larger bones is the soft bone marrow that is the place where blood cells are manufactured. Although bone cancers are very rare, there are four major types of bone cancer of primary origin. These include osteosarcoma, Ewing sarcoma, spindle cell sarcoma, and chondrosarcoma. Osteosarcoma or osteogenic sarcoma is the most common type of primary bone cancer that starts in the bones. The cancer cells in these tumors look like early forms of bone cells that normally help make new bone tissue, but the bone tissue in osteosarcoma is not as strong as that of normal bones. This type of bone cancer is seen commonly in children and young adults between ages of 5 and 20. Among young people, osteosarcoma is the third most common cancer after leukemia and brain tumors. Osteosarcoma affects larger bones, such as the thigh bone, called femur, or the shin bone, called tibia. Ewing sarcoma is a very rare type of cancerous tumor that grows in our bones or the soft tissue around the bones, such as cartilage or the nerves. It usually affects people from the ages of 10 to 20 and has a high rate of being cured. Spindle cell sarcoma most commonly form in the adults over 40 years. It is a type of connective tissue tumor and begins in layers of connective tissue, such as that under the skin, between muscles and surrounding organs. Chondrosarcoma commonly affects the sites such as pelvis, thigh bone, upper arm bone, shoulder blade, called scapula, and the ribs. Bone cancer treatment includes therapy with medication or chemotherapy to reduce the size of the tumor and then follow up with surgery to remove the affected area of the bone. Earlier bone cancer surgery involved removal of the limb altogether, called amputation. Nowadays, the affected part of the bone may be removed and replaced with metal implants, which is called limb-sparing surgery. That is the end of Part C. You now have two minutes to check your answers.